Hi, this is E. David Crawford for Grand Rounds in Urology. Microscopic hematuria is a frequent challenge we see in our urologic practices. There are a number of trade-offs, including benefit, harm, and cost in the evaluation of hematuria. Joining me to discuss this is Dr. Matthew E. Nielsen. He is a member of the Departments of Urology, Epidemiology, and Health Policy and Management at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I'm sure you'll find his presentation very enlightening. Matthew? I'm Matt Nielsen from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm presenting today trade-offs of benefit, harm, and cost in the evaluation of hematuria. These are my disclosures. The material I'm presenting today was inspired by a project with the American College of Physicians intended to increase awareness among primary care physicians about the association of hematuria with urinary tract cancer and provide practical advice to support high value care. Our review of the published guidelines highlighted differences between the AUA and other organizations in terms of the age threshold above which evaluation was recommended as well as recommendations for upper tract imaging modalities. This variability reflects both differences of opinions about implicit trade-offs among the benefits, harms, and costs of a given approach, as well as uncertainty resulting from limitations in the evidence base. A health technology assessment identified 79 algorithms, none of which had been formally evaluated in terms of its effect on patient outcomes. The more recent evidence review for the AUA guideline reiterated this problem with none of the specific recommendations therein supported by, by evidence with a grade higher than C. The High Value Care Task Force was particularly concerned about potential harms associated with CT urogram as a component of routine testing. In contrast to the AUA, the Dutch and Canadian guidelines recommend ultrasound, both explicitly citing concerns about costs and radiation exposure. The incremental clinical utility of CT urogram is uncertain given the generally low and highly variable pretest probability of upper tract findings. Given high doses associated with this type of CT, <clears throat> harms may outweigh benefits for many patients. In this context, innovative risk stratified approaches hold great promise. In 2009, urology leaders in Kaiser Permanente articulated concerns about low yield testing and potentially avoidable radiation harms associated with their historical approach, mirroring the 2001 AUA guideline. They commissioned a prospective study to examine effectiveness. The cohort of over 4,400 patients was used to develop a risk index that partitioned patients into low, moderate, and high risk of cancer detection. Ron Liu, pictured in the lower right of the slide, led this national effort. The overall cancer detection rate was similar to that observed in the AUA meta-analysis. Bladder cancer comprised approximately 90% of cancers diagnosed, with 0.3% of the cohort found to have renal cell carcinoma and zero upper tract transitional cell carcinoma. To put these results in context, the second largest single cohort of hematuria patients this one from a hematuria clinic in the UK found relatively similar cancer detection rates, despite nearly half being referred for gross hematuria. In that cohort, 10 out of 4,020 patients had upper tract TCC, seven of whom were referred for gross hematuria, and none of which were in men under the age of 50 or women under the age of 70. The application of evidence-based medicine is fraught with pitfalls, none more so than when using it to assist diagnosis. The expected performance of a test in a given clinical encounter is based on Bayes' theorem, which in turn depends on patient level factors. However, the literature tends to report weighted average performance across broad populations, which may result in spectrum bias. Described 40 years ago in a seminal New England Journal paper by David Ranzehoff, currently a colleague of mine on the faculty at UNC. This is particularly problematic in the literature informing diagnostic approaches to hematuria particularly with respect to imaging, as 11 out of 15 studies re relevant to the imaging modality question in the evidence review supporting the 2012 AUA guideline on asymptomatic microhematuria 
reported on mixed groups of patients with gross microscopic or unspecified hematuria. Related to spectrum bias is the broader principle of heterogeneity in treatment effects, wherein the balance of benefits and harms for a given clinical practice varies in a predictable way across groups of similar individuals. Based on this principle, cost considerations aside, submitting a large population of patients with an extremely low probability of findings that require CT for detection, the predictable harms from this testing will overwhelm the infinitesimally small benefit. The risk index had an ROC of 0.85 compared to 0.53 for the prior approach aligned with the AUA guideline and provided the basis for a new Kaiser guideline, which directs clinicians to defer workup for extremely low-risk patients, <clears throat> perform cystoscopy and ultrasound among moderate-risk patients, and CT and cystoscopy among the minority of patients scored as high-risk. With this current guideline, 3,782 out of 4,400 patients in the original study would avoid CT. Given these alternatives, the logical question is, what are the trade-offs? The statement, a model is a lie that helps you see the truth, from Howard Skipper, a pioneer of animal models of cancer, is applicable to the use of models as simplified representations of reality in many research contexts. Earlier this year, a team led by Josh Halpern, currently finishing his chief resident year at Cornell, published a cost-effectiveness analysis in JAMA Internal Medicine examining different approaches to evaluation of asymptomatic microhematuria. CT alone detected 221 per, per 10,000 patients at a cost of $9.3 million and was dominated by all other approaches. Ultrasound and cystoscopy detected 245 cancers per 10,000 and was most cost-effective with an incremental cost for cancer detected of $53,810. Replacing CT with ultrasound, pardon me, replacing ultrasound with CT detected just one additional cancer per 10,000 patients at a cost of $6.4 million. In the discussion, the authors note multiple studies demonstrating low rates of referral for hematuria and submit that this may be due in part to hesitation on the part of PCPs to submit their patients to costly and potentially harmful evaluations. To the extent that concerns about costs and harms from CT radiation may be driving this consistently observed phenomenon, recommendations ultimately leading to higher cystoscopy referral rates may have significant implications in terms of the overall cancer detection yield. Our group developed a mathematical simulation model to synthesize relevant evidence assigning patient characteristics from the Liu and Edward studies to a simulated population of 100,000 individuals who were then taken through a hypothetical evaluation based on <clears throat> the different guidelines recommendations and assessed costs, cancer detection rates, complications, and estimated cancers caused by radiation exposure. In addition to the explicit modeling of radiation harms, our study differed from Halpern and colleagues in that we included patients referred for microhematuria who had a history of self-limited gross hematuria. Drawing on the observation from the Liu study in Kaiser, who asked every single one of the over 4,000 patients referred for microhematuria, finding this in 19% of the sample. In addition, we compared the specific recommendations of different national guidelines and also separately modeled out the risks and detection probability for renal cell carcinoma and upper tract urothelial carcinoma whereas Halpern combined these. Their assumption could be argued to overstate the performance of ultrasound to the extent its sensitivity for upper tract TCC is lower than CT. As such, we believe this design provides a more conservative, real-world estimate of the trade-offs in play. Recognize my per recognizing my personal limitations in this field, I have the great fortune of being on faculty at UNC where I have access to methodological experts to support the type of sophisticated analyses required for this work. Specifically, I would like to acknowledge Mihaela Georgieva, a PhD candidate in the Department of Health Policy and Management, and my colleague Stephanie Wheeler, Associate Professor in the Department, pictured on the bottom of this slide, 
without whom this work would not have been possible. This table ranks the guidelines from least to most expensive. The Kaiser guideline was found to be most cost effective with an incremental cost of around 137,000 per additional cancer case detected. The AUA guideline detected the most cancers, however, at a cost of over a million dollars per additional case for a per person and total cost of nearly double that of the other approaches. The results from sensitivity analysis are presented here as cost effectiveness acceptability curves, which show the probabilities that each strategy would be considered cost effective for various willingness to pay thresholds. If decision makers were willing to pay only up to $30,000 per additional urinary tract cancer detected, then the Dutch guidelines have the highest probability of being cost effective compared to the other strategies. For willingness to pay between $37,500 and $137,500 per additional case detected, the Canadian guideline had higher probability than the other strategies, while for willingness to pay between $150,000 and $250,000 per additional case detected, the Kaiser guideline had higher probability of being cost effective. The AUA guideline had lower probability of being cost effective compared to all other strategies under willingness to pay thresholds of up to $100,000 for additional urinary tract cancer cases detected. As the willingness to pay thresholds increased, however, AUA still had lower probability of being cost effective compared to Kaiser across a wide range of thresholds up to a quarter of a million dollars per additional case detected. The largest proportion of harms we found were false positive cases based on the specificity of the different tests. These numbers do not include incidental findings, which a meta-analysis found to be present on approximately 30% of CT scans of this type. Recent case series of CT urogram estimated additional costs of $385 to $694 for every single patient distributed from the fraction who had follow-up evaluations, in whom six serious complications and two deaths resulting from subsequent invasive procedures were reported. Again, Costs and outcomes not included in our model and thus not reflected in these cost effectiveness curves. Looking closer at the outcomes, short-term complications from cystoscopy varied as a function of the proportion of the population going through the procedure, as did complications from CT, including <coughs> contrast allergy and nephropathy. But the main focus of our harm evaluation was related to radiation, as existing recommendations against uniform CT scan explicitly articulate this as the rationale. We based our estimates for radiation dose on observed real-world data from Rebecca smith Bineman, which found not only that multiphase abdomen pelvis CT had the highest average dose among common CT protocols, but also very wide variation in dose. Patient-facing websites provide tools for calculating these risks, though they do not take into account the observed real-world variation in dose. We estimated the age and gender-specific iatrogenic cancer rates from CT based on estimates from the radiation epidemiology literature, which demonstrate that the cancer risk actually follows a U-shaped distribution increasing with age. A recent excellent New England Journal article by Lisa Rosenbaum, one of the greatest medical writers of our time, cautioned the importance of acknowledging the trade-off in conversations we have about scenarios where it is argued that less is more. I believe that the case for intensive testing of all patients with hematuria is well-intentioned to the extent that the thought of missing any cancer diagnosis is hard to stomach. So let's look a, a bit more closely at these trade-offs. Three strategies that we evaluate recommend uniform approaches of differing intensity by imaging modality and age threshold for evaluation the AUA, Canadian, and Dutch guidelines. And two strategies apply risk stratification where CT imaging is reserved only for the minority of patients with high-risk features, specifically gross hematuria in the Kaiser and hematuria risk index. Given imperfect sensitivity of diagnostic testing, no strategy detected all cancers. The most intensive approach, evaluating all patients over 35 with cystoscopy and CT missed 82 out of 3,514 cases while causing an estimated 575 future cancers. The strategies reserving CT for patients with high-risk features <clears throat> reduced the estimated number of radiation-related cancers approximately five-fold. Put another way, the incremental reduction in estimated cancers caused by CT was an order of magnitude greater than the incremental missed cancers 
in the risk stratified approaches. 467 and 47 respectively for the Kaiser guideline, 439 and 33 respectively for the hematuria risk index. Existing recommendations against the uniformly intensive application of CT testing in this context explicitly cite concerns about costs and harms, in particular radiation exposure. Our findings support these concerns as the strategy of CT for all patients was associated not only with substantially greater costs, but also a larger number of false positive findings, procedural complications, and an estimated risk of radiation-induced future cancer for one out of 174 patients tested for diagnoses that have an observed case fatality of approximately 50%. These data bring to mind the cautionary words of Dean Chandler, who noted that the wondrous capabilities of modern medicine can be a double-edged sword. This table breaks down in more detail the cancers detected versus missed by cancer site. Approximately two-thirds of the incremental additional cases detected with the most intensive approach were renal cell carcinoma. Though RCC was historically associated with a triad of flank pain, palpable mass, and gross hematuria, this is increasingly an incidental diagnosis and concerns have been raised about overdiagnosis. The rate of RCC in our simulated population, 443 out of 100,000, or 0.44%, drawn from the two largest series of hematuria evaluation, <clears throat> is comparable to the rate of renal procedures and nephrectomy in a recently published series of U.S. Medicare patients undergoing chest and abdomen CT for all indications, 0.57% for renal procedures and 0.44% for nephrectomy. These data call into question the extent to which it is even appropriate to categorize RCC diagnoses obtained in this context as anything more than incidental findings. Getting back to the question of spectrum bias and the diagnostic utility of CT urogram in the specific subset of patients with asymptomatic microhematuria, this slide reflects the Lou and Edwards cohorts as well as a number of recent studies of CT urogram outcomes. A total of four patients out of 11,760 evaluated were found to have upper tract TCC, none of which were in men under 50 or women under 65, and the single female patient also had a heavy smoking history. Hematuria is a common condition, and differing approaches have clear trade-offs of cost, benefit, and harm. The Institute of Medicine Trustworthy Guidelines Report suggested a framework wherein each recommendation clearly describes potential benefits and harms, limitations and evidence, implicit value judgments, and differences of opinion regarding a given approach. Our former Cancer Center Director, Ned Sharpless, recently appointed to lead the NCI, had this iconic album cover photo from The Clash hanging on his wall as a reminder of the need to constantly question our habits and assumptions and be prepared to relinquish old ways of thinking about problems. Sometimes we need to consider smashing our guitars. The public health and policy impact of the trade-offs we just reviewed are substantial, given evidence of nearly 2 million encounters annually with U.S. urologists for hematuria evaluation in the CDC's National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey. High-value care is predicated on the question of whether a particular scheme of diagnostic testing in a given context provides health benefits worth the associated costs or harms. I would suggest that we have some work to do to optimize the value of care for hematuria in the U.S. I'd like to acknowledge Amir Kasim and the ACP High-Value Care Task Force for inspiring us to investigate this question and the strong team effort from my collaborators in Chapel Hill and across the country for the work I present to you today. Thanks very much.